People who experience flow have healthier hearts and minds. Miriam Mosing from The Conversation reports, have you ever lost all sense of space and time when redecorating a room? How about being so focused while playing an instrument that the worries that weighed you down a minute ago just evaporated? Well, that's the feeling I get when after I come out of a holy confession. Then you've probably experienced flow, they say here. Flow is a term used in psychology to describe a state of heightened concentration in which you are completely absorbed in an activity. It exists somewhere between boredom and stress, usually experienced during activities which are somewhat challenging but still meet our skill levels. When we experience flow, we tend to be highly effective, feel in control and forget about time. Flow is often a positive experience, so could it be good for our mental health? That's a question researchers, include, including me, are currently tackling. Concepts such as flow have been around for a while. Take, for example, the polarization of attention, which is a state of heightened focus proposed by the Italian educator Maria Montessori in the early 20th century. But the modern scientific version of flow has developed by, was developed by American-Hungarian-born psychologist Mihaly Sigzend Mihaly in the 1970s. Work by myself and others has shown how often and in which setting we experience flow largely differs between people and is partly genetically influenced. In other words, some people are more prone to experience flow than others, which is partly due to individual differences in genetic predispositions, but also due to factors in our environment. These may include the circumstances of the specific activities we engage in, the distractions we experience, and our mental states. Does flow cause mental health? It has been proposed that being prone to flow may be associated with many positive outcomes, including better mental and cardiovascular health. These associations have generally been interpreted as evidence for flow causing such protective efforts. These proposed benefits of flow have led to the first companies seeing business opportunities and offering flow promoting training. However, this may be a little premature. To date, most available research does not allow for any conclusions about casual effects of flow on mental or physical health. That's because the research has primarily been based on small sample sizes and self-reported data and both the predisposition to experience flow and mental health problems are partly heritable. Our, spe our specific predispositions will, together with our environment and experiences, influence how we fare in life, including whether we experience flow or mental health problems. But how exactly our genes and environment work together is still mostly unknown. This implies that the same family factors, including genetic predisposition or early childhood environment may influence both how prone we are to flow and our mental health. In that case, the associations reported would not be directly causal, but rather be down to a third factor causing both such as uh, genes or special childhood experiences. Enter neuroticism. Another such third factor could be a, co a concept called neuroticism. Neuroticism is a personality trait which describes our tendency to be emotionally unbalanced and easily irritated. People with high ne neuroticism scores are more susceptible to stress and psychological problems as well as cardiovascular and other somatic diseases. At the same time, it intuitively takes sense, makes sense that the worry, stress, and emotional instability are factors which would keep you from entering flow experiences. So it's quite possible that our predispositions, including neuroticism, would influence both our ability to experience flow and our mental health. If we then explore the relationship between flow and mental health without considering neuroticism, as most research has done, we would observe the association, but that's really driven by neuroticism. Together, this raises the question can flow really protect against certain health problems? This question was recently investigated by my student Emma Gaston at the University of Melbourne, Australia. 
and co-supervised by myself and Laura Wessel Dick, senior research in my group at Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Our paper was published in the journal Translational Psychiatry. We investigated for the first time whether neuroticism influenced the observed associations between flow and mental health and whether family factors such as genetic or early family environment may, may play a role. Also for the first time, the study tested the reverse, whether mental health problems lead to less flow. This was done using real life diagnosis from 9,300 people in the Swedish patient registry. We found that people who were more prone to experience flow had a lower risk of certain diagnosis, including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, stress-related disorders, and cardiovascular disease. This is in line with expectations of a protective effect of flow on mental and cardiovascular health outcomes. However, when considering neuroticism and family factors, flow experiences remained associated only with major depression and possibly anxiety, though associations were somewhat diminished. This finding suggests that flow may have some protective effect on those two mental health outcomes, but that the relationship is more complex than thought. On the other hand, the fact that most of these associations disappeared suggests that being prone to flow did not directly cause a lower risk for these conditions. Rather, third factors such as genes may be a better explanation. Does that mean we should engage in flow training to reduce our risk for depression and anxiety? No, research is lacking to investigate if and how we can even manipulate flow and what consequences that would have. That said, when we are in a state of flow, it's likely that we are spending less time ruminating over our lives or worrying about the future simply because we are occupied and the experience of flow in itself is rewarding. So if something you love does make you lose all sense of space and time, it's likely that it's good for you, at least in that moment. This is by Mariam Mosing, Associate Professor of Behavior Genetics, Carlos Inca Institute, from uh, The Conversation here, published under Creative Commons, and it's on Science Alert. Please leave your comments, and thank you for your support. I highly support my Patreon account, the daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support, and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.